Welcome to the first ever episode of The Depot Dive, a weekly podcast where we're going to deep dive into some of the biggest Steelers-related topics of the week. You've probably seen our articles on SteelersDepot.com or even heard our voices on the daily Terrible Take segment, but now you get to put a face to those voices. I'm your host, Ross McCorkle, and above me here on the screen is Joe Clark. Before I let Joe introduce himself, I want to give a quick plug to the phone number there at the bottom of the screen. You can call that number and leave a voicemail with a chance for us to answer your question on next week's episode. Obviously, with this week being the first episode, we will not have any to answer, but we do hope you call in. Joe, how are you doing today? Has this nasty weather reached you all the way up there in Boston? Yeah, today's one of the worst days we've had in a while. We got some rain, a little bit of sleet, just 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 generally gross weather that you don't like getting in early April when it's supposed to be, you know, nice and sunny and spring weather. But it is what it is. Um, but excited to be here, excited to do this, kind of expand a little bit of, you know, what we've been working on uh, over the last however many months at Depot. So very, very excited to get started today. Yeah, likewise. We we uh, it, it, I'm down here in Nashville and around this time of the year, pretty much every year without failure, we get some tornadoes. And so yesterday the forecast was very heavy on uh, p- panic and fear and, and it didn't end up being that bad. Just some, just some rain and wind and a little bit of hail, but we lucked out there. All right. So uh, the first topic, as you can see there on the screen that we're going to dive into, uh, we're going to be talking about some of the pre-draft visits and the pro day circuit that has pretty much just concluded yesterday, had the, I think it was yesterday, the last pro day, which was Yale. Um, There's a couple individual workouts that are scheduled for some players who maybe were injured earlier in the process, like I was Cooper to Gene and uh, people like that. But pretty much the bulk of the pro day stuff is now done. Um, So starting with, we're going to talk about the Big uh, Big 12 pro day that occurred the other day, the biggest name of interest there was uh, West Virginia center Zach Frazier. He obviously had that broken leg last year and wasn't able to participate in much of this pre-draft process. Um, and and there was, a, I think it was Isaac Williams was on site there to scout him. So that's somewhat notable. Anytime a position coach is out scouting uh, some of these players, it piques your interest a little bit. Um, so what do, you, what do you think about Zach Frazier? I mean, uh, the buzz around him has kind of been, is he going to be a first rounder? Is he going to be there when the Steelers select in the second round? Have you had a chance to watch much of Zach? Yeah. So one, one thing I want to say is that I know those numbers, the big 12 pro day weren't great, but this is a guy who literally broke his leg in November and he's coming out here just a couple months later and, you know, being able to pretty much work out in full showing that he'll be ready to go during training camp. Um, as far as him being a first rounder, I think, you know, kind of the general buzz around centers, you know, we've heard about Jackson Powers Johnson potentially falling, Graham Barton rising. I still think that Frazier's probably the number three center. So if Powers Johnson's falling, then Frazier, I think he's probably, you know, pretty stable in the second. But as to will he be there for the Steelers in the second, I think that's a very legitimate question because, I mean, I know the numbers weren't good at the pro day, but he's still one of the top centers in a class where there's, you know, a few center needy teams. So I don't think there's the Steelers – you know, should be content expecting to sit there in the second and have him be there. I think, you know, he's a very solid player. He's stout. Um, he's a, he's a, he's the type of guy that, you know, should be on the Steelers radar and likely will be, but he could go ahead of, you know, number 52 in the second round and given the Steelers need at center, I don't know if they can, you know, necessarily feel comfortable waiting. Maybe he's a trade up candidate for them in the second. There's, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they approach center in this draft. Cause right now I don't really know how you can go into the season, trusting Nate Herbig with his, what 53 career snaps of the position just it, it, it'll be very interesting but Frazier's a guy you know Williams being there I think is a clear indicator of his interest um we saw in the video that the West Virginia football account tweeted out he was talking to Frazier a little bit and I mean we know Frazier we talked to him in the comment he didn't meet with the Steelers there but as you know we've hit on before that the, this year the formal meetings weren't as big of an indicator as they have been in the past so he's definitely going to be somebody on the Steelers radar Yeah, and uh, I actually, I looked into kind of the last 10 drafts, could have maybe expanded that to to more, but the last 10 drafts, most in the first round, the centers go, you know, maybe zero, maybe one, maybe two go. That's kind of been the most, I think, two uh, a a few years back that went in the first round. 
Um, I think the average between the first and second round is is two centers going. Uh, obviously, this year, Graham Barton having some versatility to maybe play tackle if a team views him as a tackle. Um, he certainly has kind of the frame to play tackle, and he has the experience out there uh, at, at Duke. So um, if, a, if a team views him as, as being ta- tackle capable, then obviously that could push him up the board and complicate things. But really, there's just the three center prospects that are um, kind of projected to be first not maybe not week one capable starters, but you know certainly uh, at some point in their rookie season step in to be that starter, and that's definitely what the Steelers need. I'm kind of on the same page uh, with you. Uh, the, a trade up, you know, higher into the second round seems very likely, uh, especially if they end up going with something like a tackle or a receiver in the first round. Because yeah, I mean you're you're left with uh, a bunch of question marks, and and that's not what the Steelers need right now. Obviously, they just brought in Russell Wilson. Um, they're kind of, I don't want to say all in, but they are definitely trying to win now. Art Rooney, the second, put that urgency on them earlier in the off season, right after the season, kind of saying that they're getting impatient. Um, so they're trying to win now and it would be a shame to have, you know, centers, one of the two positions that touches the ball every single play. Um, you don't want a guy there who has no experience or, or, or isn't capable. Um, and Mason Cole, I mean, is that a guy who could, could circle back. I mean, he's uh, the Steelers let him go early. Uh, Omar Khan talked about letting some of those guys go early to maybe allow them to get a head start on the process, make sure that they can find a new landing spot. Here we are three weeks into free agency. Mason Cole is not signed to any team. I mean, is that somebody you could see circling back? I mean, what are their other options at this point? The the free agent center markets kind of came and went and passed them by. Uh, you sign Cole, you know, one year veteran benefit deal, then, I mean, it, it, I guess it's good business that you reduce his cap hit for a little bit from what it would have been next season. Um, I'm not sure how comfortable you can be, you know, having Cole as your guy, but let's say here, here's one realistic scenario you can throw out is they bring back Cole. And I think I for, I want to preface this, but I don't think they do it until after the draft. If the draft doesn't go the way they want, they get a center early. They can they can draft you know maybe a Hunter Norzad in the middle rounds, the Penn State center, and then sign Cole. Cole starts the first half of the season, maybe until they're comfortable, uh, or maybe even the full season. But I just it, it's not an exciting option, and it's not one that I'm a huge fan of. But it's really their only option right now. Like they they just missed on the center market. They're uh, I mean the first day they're in on Mitch Moore, so it's like all right they're my thought was they're going to find a, some sort of center one way or another, even if it's a Aaron Brewer, but they didn't. So yeah, now I think bringing Mason Cole back is a very legitimate possibility and something that if the, they don't get a Jackson Powers Johnson, a Barton or a Frazier, I think they'll bring them back and at least have them compete with, even if they draft Cedric Van Pran, they'll have him come in and it maybe have to start a few games, but just as somebody who, you know, knows the system, knows Pat Meyer and is familiar with the team. Um, it, it's a move that I, think there will be made or will be considering making yeah and that center market was pretty hot and moved pretty quickly in free agency so yeah it was robust you know, yeah and so someone like mason cole yeah he's maybe not as exciting but would you want to pay a brewer what he ended up getting paid or you know uh especially if you're planning on drafting a center uh, or just get cole back on on a like you said maybe a veteran benefit or or you know just barely above that kind of thing so um yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I all for it. I agree. Maybe it, it, they wait until after the draft, see how that shakes out. But last year, the offense had leadership issues. They The media was talking about that pretty much every week once once they got into the losing streak towards the end of the season. And um, I know Mitch Trubisky and a couple other players pointed to Mason Cole as one of the leaders in the room. So regardless of his play on the field, he is a good locker room guy by all accounts and and has the experience so um you know at the very least you aren't getting worse at the position if you bring him back you'll be just kind of staying the same uh at least in the interim all right um some other some other uh pre-draft visits and pro days obviously today uh breaking just within the last hour nate wiggins and the clemson corner uh, they brought in uh, Luke McCaffrey, the Rice wide receiver, brothers of Christian McCaffrey. Uh, they brought in, and then the Oregon uh, interior offensive lineman, what's his name? Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones. 
Yeah, not I don't know a ton about Jones, but the other two prospects, obviously Wiggins uh, had that blazing fast 40, uh, 40 time at the Combine. I believe he actually got hurt during that uh, fast run of his, so he didn't get to see a ton more of his workout beyond that, but obviously showing off that he's got uh, crazy speed. The Steelers have been lacking that kind of speed in the secondary uh, guys like Patrick Peterson, who who was up there in age, couldn't quite move as fast as he once could. Um, so Wiggins is is an option uh, to to kind of add some of that speed back to the secondary. What do you think about Wiggins? I'm a big fan. I think he is definitely in play at number 20. And like you said, I mean, it was just painful to watch last year. Patrick Peterson, he, he's getting up there in age. And then Levi Wallace was just so, so slow. Uh, those first few weeks were tough with those two guys on the outside. Uh, and I think Wiggins, you know, he's a guy, he adds that speed element. He's got, you know, some decent ball skills. Uh, I've seen a little bit of his tape and he's definitely a guy that I think if they want to go cornerback in the first round, I mean, uh, as we know, they have three or four ways they could go in the first round here with, you know, for a win now team, they have a lot of holes that they need to patch right now. But if they do go corner in the first round, I think Wiggins is probably going to be a guy that's kind of at the top of their list. Um, they saw him at the Clemson Pro Day. They had the whole whole cadre of Tomlin, or Tomlin, Khan, Arthur Smith were all there. And now, obviously, they're bringing him in. So he's a guy they're getting very familiar with. And they, they also had a form with him in the combine as well. So definitely a, a lot of demonstrated interest. They were at a ton of Clemson games this year, too, throughout the season, sending scouts. So uh, if cornerback's the pick in the first round, I think it's going to be probably Nate Wiggins. And he's a pick that I personally would be very happy with. Yeah, there's just some obvious concerns with. I mean, what he's one. He weighed in at 173. That's a little bit concerning. He, he put on. He put on. I think 10, 9, 10 pounds at his pro day. He weighed in a little bit heavier. So, uh, still, still a concern because lot pretty light in the pants. But he did add weight after the combine because that was that was like he was like a bean pole at the combine. That was that was very light for an NFL cornerback. Yeah, I mean, some of these guys obviously want to maximize their 40 time, and part of doing that's maybe cutting a little bit of weight, and so. He put the weight back on. Maybe he's not as fast, but he's still obviously not going to be losing too much off that 40 time, just adding that weight. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of struggle personally with uh, the idea of them taking a corner in the first round just because where it would leave you with with the other positions. Um, corner, I mean, they have Dante Jackson, whatever you think of him. Tomlin seems to like him. Uh, they've had interest in him for a long time. He himself said that uh, since the trade. So, um, you know, I, I think there's more pressing needs, but certainly Wiggins is an interesting name and one that could very well be the pick. Uh, and the th- yeah. And the thing like you, like you said, with taking the corner is there's so much depth in this class too. Like the third and fourth round, there's solid cornerbacks that they could take, you know, there's Kyrie Jackson, there's Cam Hart, there's Isaiah Johnson from Syracuse. So they met with other pro day and all those guys are kind of that mold of those Joey Porter jr. Six, you know, six, two plus, uh, long arms, you know, pretty pretty athletic for their size, and the avatar Corey Trace corners. And honestly, like, if I'm a I'm more of a proponent, you know, take a cornerback on the third and take a cornerback in the fifth because you need depth right now. Because behind, you know, Jackson and Porter, you're looking at a bunch of guys who really haven't played a lot. You know, you got Trice, you got uh, Darius Rush, and obviously Trice coming back from the injury. And there there there's some upside there, but they can't really be relied on. So with me. For me, I think add as many of those guys into that room as possible and have them compete, you know, the whole iron sharpens iron. And then you might be able to, you know, find a pretty solid third corner out of that. And then obviously they do need a slot corner as well. So maybe one of those two picks comes in the slot. Maybe a Mike Sanders still in the second or the third. But yeah, I, I'm also, I, I'm with all the other needs they have, a cornerback in the first, if it's a pick, fine, but it's, I wouldn't be super thrilled about it. Yeah, agreed. Uh, one more interesting uh, pre-draft visit that came through yesterday, among some other names, uh, defensive lineman Mason Smith there from LSU. Uh, I think it was a couple years ago, our Alex Kazora here on the site put together a study of what the Steelers look for in drafting defensive linemen. Um, and he kind of compiled every defensive lineman drafted by the team over the last several you know years. Or I think it was maybe over Colbert's whole tenure. I can't remember. The specifics there, but um, it came down to you know these guys. They like these long uh, six four plus two ninety plus uh, guys with arm arm length above thirty two inches. Um, you know, athletic types. Mason Smith. I think he had some injury issues and stuff that maybe hampered him a little bit at the end of his college career there. But 
Uh, he's got the 35-inch arms. He's got the, I think he's 6051, uh, 306 pounds. He ran a 50140. So he's got some of that kind of mold that the Steelers go after. I think he actually uh, compares pretty favorably to Stephon Tuitt, uh, which obviously they haven't had a, a, a athletic freak on the defensive line like that since Tuitt retired. Um, so what what are your thoughts on Mason Smith and, and where do you think he might kind of go in the draft? Yeah, that's the, the, the range of where he can go is something that I think is, you know, a little bit interesting because I've seen him mocked, you know, at times in the mid to late second. Uh, we, we can have him mocked in the fourth round, you know, like he's one of those guys that it's really going to depend on how the position goes uh, in the draft early. Like if there's a run on tackles, somebody might go and take him earlier. Um, I think he's a solid prospect. He's a guy that, you know, he stood out in a loaded LSU defensive line that him, they had Mikai Wingo, that Jordan Jefferson, who was a West Virginia transfer. Uh, and he was, you know, he was able to still make an impact and he, it just, I don't, I know they need D line depth, but with all the other holes, I don't know if I can get behind D line in the second, especially after signing Dean Lowry and bringing back Mon Adams, if I had it done that and then the depth would be horrible but now you know these have something to fall back on they can wait until the third or the fourth so if smith's there in the fourth i think it might be a run to the podium type of pick he fits what they look for he's a talented player but i don't know if you i don't know if he's a guy that i would feel comfortable taking you know beyond maybe that second third round pick that they have this year yeah yeah i i agree uh it does kind of concern me for the future of this of this team on the defensive line i mean yeah they re-signed mon adams and they brought in lowry uh, but I believe Lowry's turning 30 this year. Ogan Joby's turning 30 this year. Cam Hayward's obviously in the last couple, you know, season or two of his career. Uh, they really just have uh, Keanu Benton. And, you know, I don't think DeMarvin Leal or, or Isaiah Loudermilk are kind of going to take that next step from what, it, from what we've seen so far. Um, so it's going to become basically their top need next year in my eyes. Uh, outside of maybe quarterback, depending on how some of that goes. Um, speaking of the quarterback situation, uh, transitioning to our next topic here, some of the chatter on Russell Wilson and uh, Justin Fields and kind of, you know, maybe what's the Steelers' ceiling with these guys? Are they going to play uh, both of them? I mean, is Fields going to see the field? Is he going to have a chance to compete? If he doesn't win the job, is he going to be, you know, kind of deployed in specialized packages? Where are you at on some of that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, Mike Tomlin said Russell Wilson's in pole position to win the job. I'd be very surprised if Russell Wilson doesn't win the job unless he's a total disaster in training camp in the preseason. Even if Justin Fields performs well, I think Russ is getting the first crack at it. And at this point, I mean, he's a Super Bowl winner. He's proven more in his career. The last two years in Denver weren't great but i mean last year the the raw numbers were fine um i think getting an arthur smith's offense kind of letting the two of them i mean we heard when they first met that the two of them met for hours i view that as a positive sign that russ is going to you know buy into the offense and not kind of do his own thing or freelances you know as we've read or heard that he did a little bit last year in denver i know former Steeler chad brown so that was a big issue with him in um sean payton's offense but uh what what's their upside with them uh, I think they can win a playoff game, which at this point I'll take. But with just how good the AFC is and how the roster is currently constructed, we don't know how they're going to fill the hole as a receiver, how they're going to fill the hole as a center right now. So, but, so I can't really say with confidence that they're anything more than win 10, 11 games and win a playoff game. Last year they won 10 games, they lost a playoff game. This year I could see you win 10 games, but you actually win the playoff game. So that's really the ceiling. Um. The specialized packages for fields, I think, are something we might see, uh, maybe in the red zone, something he uses like something he uses athleticism. I mean, he he's he's a weapon for you to use, even if he's not, uh, you know, an every down guy. And then, you know, you can kind of get a get him on the field, maybe see what you have for the future. But I think he helps you in now with just some of the just stuff he can do is just an athletic freak as a quarterback. Um so yeah, that'll be something very interesting. And I'm sure we'll get a hint of that in training camp as well. See if they, you know, break something out every now and then, you know, last year they ran the Connor Hayward pass in training camp and they had a Connor Hayward pass in the game last year. So uh, you, we'll, we'll, we'll get a little hint of some things they might see during camp. So maybe we'll get a taste of a specialized Justin Fields package. It would definitely be, uh, definitely be interesting to see and fun to watch. 
Yeah, and I mean, look, last year, obviously, the Steelers started three different quarterbacks all around the league. Uh, backup quarterbacks were kind of the story of the 2023 season. Um, so chances are pretty good, especially with Russell Wilson up there at 35, I believe, turning 36 this season, something like that. Um, you know, ch- uh, he takes a lot of sacks. The Steelers' offensive line has improved, but uh, figured to have a couple new pieces along the line. Uh, he's probably going to continue taking a lot of sacks. He likes to hold on to the ball a little bit too long. So I, I, I think there's a pretty good chance that we will at least get to see Field start a game or two, if not more. Uh, hopefully those specialized packages do uh, become a thing. Uh, I, I mean, back in Todd Haley's years uh, with Le'Veon Bell, uh, they deployed some of that Wildcat stuff, and I think they even had Ben lining up out at wide receiver for a couple snaps. Now, Ben uh, uh, said that he didn't, he wasn't a big fan of, of that situation. Uh, I don't think quarterbacks, uh, franchise quarterbacks, enjoy having the ball taken out of their hand like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Russell kind of manages that if Fields is kind of subbed in in certain situations. But, um, you know, I, I, th- I think overall, if, if you're summing it up, they obviously improved at the quarterback position. The two biggest issues of last season, at least in my opinion, were uh, the quarterback play and the offensive coordinator, uh, just kind of overall creativity and scheme. Uh, obviously, they have completely changed both of those things. Uh, It remains to be seen if that is going to be for the better, Uh, but I think the chances are pretty good, (laughs) just given what we saw last year, that it will be be a little bit better. Right. So uh, obviously, and the the other aspect of that is is the fact that um, last year, I believe the Steelers had maybe a bottom five, or sorry, like one of the easiest strengths of schedule, maybe the second or third or fourth easiest strength of schedule in the league. Um, And then this year, I believe they are, on the other end of the spectrum with like the second or third hardest strength of schedule. So, you know, not all, it's, it's important to remember not all things remain the same. So yes, maybe they upgraded some of these things, but, uh, they're going to be having a tougher road ahead of them. Um, and, and, you know, last year with that easy schedule, it was made even easier with, you know, facing guys like, uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson and, uh, some of these backup quarterbacks that they face throughout the year. So, um, Yes, all that's very interesting. Uh, There was one kind of, uh, not a report, but just some speculation from uh, Post-Gazette's Jerry Dulac the other day in one of his chats, just kind of saying that, um, you know, Russell Wilson and the Steelers, yes, they plan to do their uh, kind of an extension talk after this season. um, But he said with Fields, he could, it wouldn't surprise him if Fields' contract was visited prior to uh, that. And obviously prior to that would mean before the season because the Steelers do not negotiate in season. Uh, Do you think there's a chance that Fields, uh, you know, maybe signs a a one or two year extension? Obviously, they're not going to pick up his fifth year option. Well, I I shouldn't say obviously. It seems very unlikely that numbers like 25 million or something like that. And that becomes fully guaranteed if they do pick it up. If they view him as a backup, they aren't going to pick that up. But um, could you see them try and uh, work something out? And, and if so, would Fe- I mean, would Fields have any incentive to do that on his camp? That's that's the thing I keep going back to. It would be great business if they could work something out, get him locked up. I mean, obviously, they're not going to pick up the 25 whatever million. But when I think about it, if you think about it from Fields' perspective, you don't know if Russ is going to get hurt this year, or if he's going to struggle and Fields is going to step in. And then all of a sudden, you sign an extension that, you know, two-year deal, whatever, uh, or even a one-year extension to keep him under contract beyond 2024 for the 2025 season. And then you're locked into a deal that, you know, maybe pays you top backup money. And sure, then if he plays well, then I'm sure he'll go back to the Steelers and they can revisit it and maybe tack on more. But right now, I don't know where the incentive really comes in for him to take that extension. But then the flip side of that is, is if he doesn't play at all this year, then what's his market going to be? Uh, and if he, if he, I mean, if he's only using specialized packages, rides the bench, then you're basically the team he goes and enters the market. The team's paying him for what he did in Chicago, what will then be two seasons prior. So for him, it might be, he might, there's really two ways you can think about it. It's really get your money now and secure at least, you know, a couple million, probably seven, eight, nine million for season. That's, I mean, that's top dollar for a backup. Maybe it'll be a little less. Uh, or wait, let the season play out. And if you think you're going to play and you think you can play well, then walk in, maybe get a franchise tag. I mean, there's precedent for a team declining the fifth year and picking up the franchise tag, the Giants said with Daniel Jones. And then, of course, they're to give him that awful extension, which 
it's kind of set the franchise back there. But um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. I think the Steelers ha- are incentivized to get it done because they want to, you know, have Fields locked down for at least another year, even if it's just as a backup. Uh, but for him, it's going to be it's going to be a debate on whether or not it'll be worth it. And I think if they ha- if it happens, it'll be an awesome deal. And if it doesn't, then I'd be curious to see how this season plays out, what his future in Pittsburgh might be. Yeah, and I just keep coming back to it's. Uh, I mean, Russell Wilson could and and the Steelers could have mutual interest in an extension, but that's obviously contingent on him playing well, uh, and and whatever his price tag may end up being, which from his last two you know big contracts that he's negotiated, um, it's been pretty pricey, and and he kind of views himself as that. Uh, I mean, he he said recently that he wants to win. I think three more Super Bowls or something or two more Super Bowls in the next uh, in his five year plan. So he views himself that way. Are the Steelers going to be able to come to an agreement? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I would love to for them to lock up Justin Fields. Um, obviously, the circumstances surrounding his trade to Pittsburgh, if they're to be believed, um, he wanted to come to Pittsburgh. His agent was against some of the other teams. So I don't know if that it's kind of a signal of him being like, okay, I, maybe I am willing to. He, he obviously knew Wilson was going to be there when he when he did the trade, so maybe he's kind of either betting on himself or he's aware that he's just going to be kind of a, maybe a backup for a year or two before he kind of relaunches his career. I, this thing can take so many different paths. It's hard to hard to say, but um, if they're not able to do an extension, then next off season is going to be. Uh, basically like this last off season all over again, we're going to be having every single quarterback linked to the Steelers. We're going to be talking about what the contracts could be for both Wilson and fields. And there's going to be, you know, uh, who knows where, where that's going to go. So God help us. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Well, transitioning to, uh, our last topic here, just talking about a couple recent mock drafts that have come through. Um, one that I wrote up, uh, this morning that I thought was kind of interesting. I don't know if I love it, but CBS Sports' Josh Edwards had the Steelers moving back seven spots in the first round. I don't think they've moved back in the draft since drafting Casey Hampton back in, I think it was 2001 or somewhere in that range, uh, was their last trade back in the first round. Obviously, Omar Khan has shown that he's willing to trade um, last year, he traded up three spots to get Broderick Jones. Um, and, and, and when they traded back in this mock draft, they selected Georgia wide receiver Lad McConkie. Um, so what are your, what are your thoughts? Uh, I guess I'll let you open up on that. Yeah, uh, Josh Edwards, I think he's actually a fellow Xavier grad, but I really don't like this mock draft at all. Uh, not only like move like McConkie, I think he's a fine prospect. I like him more on day two than day one. Um, I mean, short area, mid, like he, he can win at all three levels. Uh, like he, he's got, he's got great feet. He can move, but just, I was looking at who's on the board at 20. So you're passing on Powers Johnson. Fine. You're passing on Graham Barton. So you're passing on both of them to move down. And then you take McConkie over a receiver who personally, I, I'm probably higher on him than most, uh, but I love Eddie Mitchell out of Texas. I went for them to take McConkie with Eddie Mitchell still sitting there. It's just, I, I didn't really understand it. And it's not a move I would love. Um, and I don't think they'll trade down, like you said. They haven't moved down since Casey Ham was um, 01 out of Texas. Um, I so I don't see them moving down. And if they do, is it really going to be for Lad McConkey? Like, I, I, I just he's a he's a he's a fine slot receiver. Steelers need a slot receiver, good, he can produce immediately. I just think there's better options not, uh, at receiver and not even at receiver at 20, take Graham Barton and, you know, get yourself the center for your future. If you view him as a tackle, get yourself a tackle can play along Roder Jones. Um, so yeah, I was not a fan of that uh, mock draft at all. Uh, but I do think I, like, I don't hate McConkie as a prospect. I think he's a solid player. Just given the context of how it all went down, it's just not something I'd be a fan of. Yeah. And I think I look back through his mock and eight tackles were off the board by the end of the first round. Both Jackson Powers Johnson and Graham Barton were off the board by the end of the first round. So pretty much his mock is, in my opinion, basically a worst case scenario um, for the team. I mean, if you're trading down, you have to have a plan. This 
is kind of the antithesis of a plan. They're not going to end up getting a tackle they like. They're not going to end up probably getting a center they like. They're going to have to panic and trade up in the second round and probably give away some of the draft capital that they just got from the trade down. So I don't know really what there is to gain there. And there's so many good receivers. I don't know if you really need to be um, selecting one in the first round, uh, especially one that might be available at their pick at 51 potentially. So, um, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of that either. Just kind of found it interesting. I, I did the math on the draft value chart, and I think they would fetch, um, obviously they'd swap first, so the 20th for the 27th, and then they would fetch, I believe, like a third and a fifth. It's just like, is that really uh, worth worth putting yourself in a bind with the center and the tackle position? I don't I don't think so. So Absolutely not. Um. There's some other ones here we wanted to talk about. Uh, Alex, our Alex Kazora here on the site, had his latest mock draft posted version 3.0, kind of that post-free agency mock draft. He had, um, I think in his last one, the center position was addressed in the second round with Zach Frazier and I believe Amarius Mims in the first round. This time he switched things up and had uh, Graham Barton there in the first round. Um, we've talked a little bit about him throughout the show. I think if you're going for a center in the first round, regardless of if he is the best center, I think he is the best option in the first round if you're going to address the center position just because he has that versatility to potentially play tackle. He's got, I mean, I think uh, Dave ran his relative athletic score the other day, and he was literally top, you know, 999 uh, he was 10. He was 10 even. Was he 10? Okay, yeah. so he's he's basically one of the top center, you know, athletes just from his measurables and his his testing numbers um available or 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 really uh, in the last several drafts. So, um I think that that upside and just the ability to switch positions and and you know, if it doesn't work out at center, it could work out at tackle. Uh if it doesn't work out at tackle even, I mean, he didn't have experience playing guard, but I mean, he's the type of athlete, he has the good footwork, he's got a lot of good kind of fundamentals and technique in his in, in, that I saw on his tape. Um I I do think you're not going to, you know, end up with somebody who's unable to start at one of the five positions along the offensive line. The other two guys are more pure centers. Um, and if they don't work out, you know, I, they're not really going to be able to move around as much. Um, so to me, Graham Barton uh, is definitely kind of in my head moving up the board in terms of a possibility in the first round, just because if you don't take a center in the first round, it, it really looks like trouble. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to find one, and, and I don't know if they can afford for that to happen. Um, in the second round, he had, had Ricky Pearsall, uh, from Florida. Do you have any thoughts there on Ricky? I mean, I loved watching his tape from what I saw. That one-handed catch he made this season was crazy. Uh, he, and he's, the Steelers also brought him in for a pre-draft visit. He's somebody that I think could come in and start immediately opposite George Pickens, be a very productive receiver as a rookie. And I mean, that, I think that second round is really that that, that first uh, that spot at 51 is kind of the sweet spot for the Steelers to find a receiver. If it's not Pearsall, it can be Malachi Corley. It's not Malachi Corley, it can be Troy Franklin. There's a lot of receivers who in past years would be considered, you know, maybe late first, which, and these guys kind of are still considered, you know, fringe, maybe late first round picks, but just because of the depth of the receiver class, they're going to fall. Somebody's going to fall. So I definitely could see uh, Pearsall being a guy that comes in, is immediately productive. Uh, that, 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 that's a pick I would be very much on board with in the second round. Yeah, and his his tape, I mean, he's maybe not the best blocker, but he's very willing. Um, and he does fit into the blocks. Well, he just doesn't stick to the blocks. Well, and, and with how run heavy the Steelers are going to be, I mean, the willingness as a blocker is half the battle for these wide receivers. We obviously saw that last year with some of the efforts that, uh, Deontay Johnson and George Pickens put out there. So a guy who's willing like that, he has experience in the slot. Uh, he can play, you know, kind of inside and outside. I think he'd be a great pick. Um, now, is he going to last to 51? I don't know. It seems like people are starting to kind of push him higher up boards, but you know, that kind of happens this time of year with a bunch of prospects and ultimately people have to fall. So, um, I think he'd be a good pick there in the second round. We'll just go over Alex's, uh, he had Mason Smith there in the, in the second pick in the third round. We already talked about Mason in the first pick of the third round there. He had Andrew Phillips, a guy who just came in for a pre-draft visit, 
uh, either just came in or is about to. I don't know if we know the exact date on that, but I think I think he might have been one of the guys that came in yesterday. Okay, so um, yeah, Andrew Phillips from from Kentucky. He's uh, five one oh six, so he's five ten and six eighths, one hundred and ninety pounds. I think he had a forty two inch vertical, so he's explosive. Um, his 40, his 40 was okay. It wasn't great. I can't remember the exact number, something like four, five, one or four, four, nine, somewhere in that range, which is good. It's just not, you know, it's, it's not, um, top end speed per se, but, uh, yeah, he's an intriguing guy. I think he played most of his snaps out there, uh, out wide, but he did also play some in the slot. I think he projects to be more of a slot, honestly, with just how physical he is. The Steelers are in desperate need of a slot option. They don't have anyone on the roster that is the obvious choice right now. They've kind of been going by committee the last handful of years since Mike Hilton left, so they need somebody. I mean, the slot position's just grown in importance so much in the league, um, so Phillips is an interesting option there. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I mean, I think him and Mike Sanders are really your, your two guys you look at when you look at some potential slot corner options for the Steelers. Um, Phillips, like he's played outside in college, but he's, he's going to have to kick inside. Um, and then I, I, what I like about Alex's mock too, is he has them doubling up on corners. So he has Phillips there and then he has Deontre Prince in the seventh. And I, like I said earlier in the show, I really like the idea of doubling up on either, you know, cornerback or wide receiver. One of those two positions that especially receiver, they've had success drafting and corner. I think they just need to add some bodies to the room to kind of compete. Uh, so I, I like the idea of Phillips and then you add Deontre Prince. You can be a little bit more of an outside option to work, you know, behind Dante Jackson, behind Joey Porter Jr. and add some depth there. Uh, but I definitely think that slot corner is probably the, the if they go, when they go corner early, I think it's going to be a Sanders still or Phillips because they need a slot corner. And otherwise, it's going to be they'll sign Shannon Sullivan again, like right after the draft. And I mean, he was he was okay for the Steelers last year. He he came on a little bit, but it's definitely not the most exciting option. And I think they kind of need to find a more permanent solution there than, as you said, just going committee with, with as they've been doing the last couple of seasons. Yeah, noticeably, uh, or sorry, notably missing from uh, his draft, at least in the early rounds, as somebody who could step in right away as an offensive tackle. Uh, he has Travis Glover, that Georgia State kid um in the sixth round with the first of the two sixth round picks um so uh, yeah i mean that would be obviously committing to dan moore jr for his his the final year of his rookie deal uh that would also be committing to broderick jones staying on the right side just because of what they've said about uh, uh dan moore just being a better left tackle than he is a right tackle so glover's an interesting kind of name there uh, he's uh, his tape i think alex did his uh, scouting report didn't come away overly impressed uh, when i talked to glover at the senior bowl he was a late addition there he told me they ran the ball a whole lot at georgia state so he's very very inexperienced as a pass protector um so you know this isn't a guy who's gonna step in and start you know year one or probably even year two this would be a developmental guy possibly even kick inside to guard at some point um, but he does have a uh, kind of intriguing size at 6064, 317 pounds. I think he's got some nice long arms. Um, so yeah, kind of a piece of clay to work with, but it would leave it would leave the tackle position in an interesting spot this year. Uh, it would kind of be relying on maybe someone like Spencer Anderson to be the backup at that position for this season. I mean, what else do they have there right now? Yeah, there's really not much. Uh, I mean, Spencer, he got some work there. He could be the swing guy. And I know, I think Ray Fittipaldo threw him out as an option too, to, you know, potentially get some, get some reps in training camp and be a, if the Steelers go as a right tackle option, he, I think he's a real long shot, but yeah, he's, if you go Glover, I think he's probably going to sit a year, not, not play a ton. And Spencer Anderson's your swing option. Um, I think that the Steelers are pretty high on Dan Moore, which is why this is a route they could go. Uh, but if you if you if you wait on tackle early, then Glover like I great I would if they do that I hope he develops. But I feel like you're ending up with best case scenario another Dan Moore. He's a fourth round pick. They started him immediately, and he kind of is what he is. Like where we we haven't gotten a lot of like the like Dan Moore hasn't like taken any like huge steps forward. Like he's he's gone he's gone marginally better for sure. But he's not like he's 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 not gonna like when he, he's not yeah he's not anything special at the left tackle position. So uh, if you don't go with tackle early, I think you're just kind of ending up with like, eh, like, yeah, he'll be all right at that position. So 
it's it's a route they might go with all the needs that they have, but it's not necessarily the most exciting route if you want them to improve tackle. And I do worry about leaving Broderick Jones at right tackle for another year because then you move into left tackle. Then he hasn't played left tackle in two years. So that's another like dilemma, even though they, I know Omar Khan said eventually he'll move to the left side. And I think he's really a much better left tackle than he is right tackle. We saw some struggles at the end of last season, which hopefully, you know, a full offseason work in the position, maybe he'll iron himself out, but – I would be in favor of them taking a you know, potential right tackle early in the draft instead of just kicking the position down the line. Yeah, yeah, that is a very good point about leaving Broderick on the right side. I mean, half if he ends up playing right tackle this year, uh, he will have surpassed his total experience playing left tackle in college where he had 19 starts. Um, I think, what, he had how many starts last year? Maybe... Third week, nine. So nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 10. 10, yeah, 10 starts. So, um, yeah, I mean, halfway through the year, you're talking about a guy who's now, <laughs> he's more experienced on the right side than he is the left. So, um, yeah, very, very interesting thing to think about there. All right, well, that is all that we have for our topics today. Thank you guys for tuning in for the first ever episode of The Depot Dive. I'm Ross McCorkle. That's Joe Clark. Um, another plug there for our hotline. 412-254-3145. Please do give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. We will play it live on air, and we will answer your question at the end of next show. Thank you guys so much. We hope you join us again.